All right, so you just took a test on chemical reactions. And now we're going to look into something called chemical quantities, and especially the quantities involved in chemical reactions. What you have to know about is a few things that we've just got done completing, especially molar mass. You must be able to convert between grams and moles and moles to grams because those units are what we will use for the rest of the year every time we are dealing with any chemical reaction. All right, so that's the first thing. There's something else you need to be aware of as well. And it is what was a mole. This was on the exam and hopefully you remembered it because it's been talked about multiple times in our class. And a mole identifies the number of particles that are in a sample. It's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, either atoms or molecules or pieces, whatever it is. It is a really large number. And thus you need to remember that value. It is gonna be important only in the sense that you know that there's lots of particles involved in a chemical reaction. So as that takes place, you also need to know if I have a mole of something, what is its mass going to be? So the molar mass, as we can see written here, is the mass of one mole of a sample. There are other terms that you will see in worksheets and other problems and other textbooks and other places. This term molar mass is not the only way to refer to a substance. It can also be called formula mass because it is like the mass of what that formula weighs or gram formula weight. I was looking around for a worksheet earlier and what I saw said gram formula weight. And I was like, all right, I better tell everybody about that one in case it shows up. So those are the ways that we look at molar mass. Again, if we're talking about an individual element, you look at the periodic table and you take the value that is on the periodic table, whatever that little number is for the average atomic mass, that is the mass of one mole of that sample, all right? So for example, I have three things here on the board for you. Uh, let's actually do this for a second. 32 grams per mole for oxygen. So notice that oxygen is O2. As O2, that means there are two oxygen atoms that have been stuck together to make an oxygen molecule. So its molar mass of one mole of oxygen gas is 32 grams per mole. One of the substances you used in the lab last week was silver nitrate dissolved in water. So silver nitrate is AgNO3. If you were to take the periodic table and add them all up, it's 169.88. Trust me, get out a calculator, check it if you need to. That's correct. CuOH2, copper 2 hydroxide, was one of the byproducts of a reaction that we've done a couple times. When you put these things together, they form hydroxide as a minus one charge. So there needs to be two of them because the copper is a plus two charge. Its molar mass is 97.57 grams per mole. All right, so the other thing about this is there's another way of describing how a chemical is made up. It is called percent composition. And one of these problems, we should have done this a long, long time ago, but we're trying to get like, I don't know how to say it the right way. I want you to have strong understanding of what it is we are doing. So we've been going kind of slow through things. And that's fine, it's good. I wanna go slow and make sure you get it more than just rushing through material. So this idea of percent composition is what percent of the total mass comes from each of the individual elements. I didn't have room to write it because I would run out of screen space. So what total mass percent comes from all of the things that make up that sample? So each element that makes it up has a percentage. One way you can think about this is if you were making chocolate chip cookies, what percent of your cookie comes from chocolate chips? It's not most of the mass. Most of the mass of a cookie comes from the flour and the sugar and all the stuff that gets mixed together. The chocolate chips are important, but they're not the major mass. Again, I'm not talking about quantity or importance of, well, it's not a chocolate chip cookie if I don't have a chocolate chip. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, if we're looking at the mass, the percent composition of mass, what percentage of it comes from each of these individual things? So I did these three things except for oxygen because oxygen is 100% oxygen. It's an element. An element is 100% pure element. There's no percent composition to look at. But the silver nitrate and the copper 2 hydroxide, we've done on this, well, I've only done the silver nitrate so far. Um, what you have to do is you take each of the individual elements that we've taken, and we've added those up to get the 169.88. No problem so far, okay? But now what we need to look at is what percentage of the entire thing comes from those individual atoms. 
So silver nitrate is all of these things stuck together to be 169.88 grams per mole. How many of those grams come from silver? So you take your calculator, take 107.87, and you divide by the total, 169.88. It's, again, percent composition is the same thing as percent of a grade on a test. So I, the test was worth 169.88. The only ones I got right were silver. I got 107.87 out of 169.88 to three significant figures. This is going to be 63.5% silver. 63.5% silver. For nitrogen, we take the 14.01 divided by 169.88, and we get 8.25%. And that is of nitrogen. And then the last part, we take 48 out of 169.88, and we get 28.3%. So now there's another thing that's going to pop into these problems of oxygen. 28.3% oxygen. So now, to double check that you've done these correctly, all you have to do is go back through and add up your percentages. The problem is we rounded one of these to three significant figures and it added another decimal place. So what we're going to say about these is when you add them up, the percent composition needs to be between 99.9 .9 and 100.1%. So if we make in the range of 99.9 .9 to 100.1, these are considered acceptable percent compositions. If you were to add these together, 63.5 plus 8.25 plus 28.3, guess what? We end up with a little bit more than 100%, but it falls inside this range. That is an acceptable answer because we're going to be rounding things to three significant figures. I would probably be willing to bet that something like 90% of the time when you do these problems, you will get exactly 100% when you add them back up. So you're taking the part that you've got of each thing divided by the whole. And then the part divided by the whole, and then to make sure they should add up to 100%. I didn't do the second one, and I'm not going to because I'm going to run out of time. If you need more practice with this, we'll talk more about this. This is something we should have already done, and we didn't. And so I just needed to throw it back in there because it's an important concept that will show up later on. All right, so moving on from here. Um, we need to talk about what was happening with those balanced equations we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. What information is actually being given to us by this chemical equation? So one of the ways we can look at this is if we went way, way, way down super duper small to the micro scale, we're looking at each individual atom or molecule that's reacting. Now, we can't see that in real life. All we can see is macro scale, big, large samples. So what we're going to say a balanced equation shows us is the number of moles of each substance that are involved in the reaction. This is again why it's important to know how to balance equations. If you can't balance the equation, then you're going to be defying the law of conservation of mass and that's not okay. So we've got to understand what's going on. We've got to be able to balance the equations. And what we're looking at is each of those numbers is going to be a mole of sample. Again, you're not really familiar with moles, and that's fine because it's still beginning chemistry stuff. That's not a big deal. You know what a mole is, but we're like, I, I don't really know what a mole is. It's okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this from an analogy st standpoint instead. Okay? So every equation is actually a ratio of how those substances react. We don't really know moles, but we know real life, and we know like we can use analogies of things in real life that we can use to make sure we understand this. So we're going to look at this with what I call the sandwich analogy. And I don't care about all the other stuff, the condiments. We don't care about ketchup. We don't care about mustard or mayonnaise. We don't care about salad dressings. We don't care about tomatoes and pickles. All we care about is the primary ingredients of a sandwich. If you went to anywhere and you said, make me a sandwich and let me decorate it myself, pretty much you're going to get something like this. This is my definition of a sandwich. And this is the way we're going to use this for the analogy. So don't get into these little fights about, oh, that's not how I would make it. So two pieces of bread is going to be mandatory, right? So you take piece one, piece two, we're going to stick them together. That's the whole point of it being called sandwich. Three pieces of turkey, like I wrote turkey, but it could be meat of any kind. So we're just going to say three meats, whether it's ham, turkey, sliced rotisserie chicken, I don't care. Whatever it is that you're putting inside there, we're going to say that there's three pieces of meat and one slice of cheese. Once I put all of these things together in a synthesis reaction, we will create one sandwich. Hopefully that's not too difficult. So again, I have two Bs 
plus three T's plus one C is going to form one S. This is our balanced chemical equation. Because an S, we could break the sandwich apart into being B, uh, sorry, B, two, T, three, C. That would be the formula of a sandwich, but we're gonna do substitution instead of calling it B, two, T, three, C, because that's kind of hard to say. <clears throat> we will call it S, all right? So it takes two breads, three turkeys, one cheese to put together a sandwich. This is the ratio that we have to put these things together every time to have a sandwich. And as you are probably well aware, if you ran out of bread, you would not be able to make any more sandwiches. If you ran out of turkey, you would not be able to make any more sandwiches. And if you ran out of cheese, you would not be able to make sandwiches according to the definition that we have made. Yes, you can make a grilled cheese sandwich if you ran out of meat. Yes, you can make a turkey sandwich with no cheese, that's fine. That's not our definition of sandwich. We're looking at this from if I wanna make this sandwich, as soon as I ran out of those things, I couldn't make any more. So if I wanted to make sure I was buying things in the right proportions, I would need to know how to build my sandwiches. I would need to know that every package of bread contains 40 slices of bread. Well, okay, great. That's 40 pieces of bread. How many sandwiches can I make? That's using a ratio, right? Every equation is a ratio. For every 20 sandwiches that I'm going to make, I need 40 pieces of bread. This is not a complicated thing when we look at it from terms of real life substances. If I want, I have turkey and I go to the store or go to some deli and they sell me this package of turkey that's sliced really, really thin. That's why we use more than one piece. And I say, okay, how many are inside this thing, Mr. Deli Man? And he says, oh, there's 60 pieces of meat inside that little thing. Sweet. One loaf of bread was 40 pieces of bread. So that's 20 sandwiches. 60 pieces of meat Guess what? If I take 60 and divide it by three, like I'm pulling out three pieces, I can make 20 pieces, 20 sandwiches that way too. This is great. That's a perfect ratio. And then I say, all right, Mr. Cheese Man, how many pieces of cheese are in a package? And he says, 10. And we go, oh, stink. I got to make two packages of cheese in order to use everything up. So we use these ratios to make sure we don't have leftovers. We don't have things like uh, excess of one thing, but everything else runs out. This is the idea of these chemical equations and what it tells us. All of this is a big old ginormous fancy term that I forgot to write on the page, so I'm going to write it down. It is called stoichiometry. There it is. Stoichiometry is the term that we use for what is happening in terms of a chemical reaction. It comes from Greek and it has to do with how many of an element there are in what's taking place. We are studying and measuring the quantities of substances in a chemical reaction. So previously we just looked at chemical reactions. Now we're looking at quantities in reaction and it's this thing called stoichiometry. It is all related to the number of moles of substances that react. The number of moles is like number of pieces of bread. So two pieces of bread at the micro scale level is making a sandwich. That's one of those things reacting. But what if I had two moles of bread and three moles of turkey and one mole of cheese? That's a lot of bread and meat and cheese. And now I can make one mole of sandwiches. It is a ratio. The problem is we can't go into the lab and start counting out the little pieces parts that make up these substances. All I can do is weigh them using a digital balance or using a triple beam balance which means you need to be able to convert from grams that we can measure in the lab into moles to know how they're going to react. So what we need to do is we're gonna look at this again. Every equation is a ratio of how these substances react. And now if we look at a balanced equation like the one we did for water a long time ago, this first one's balanced, the other ones are not. So if we balance this equation, what we're saying is that for every two moles of hydrogens, I need one mole of oxygen available and they will react together and form two moles of water, all right, of water vapor or gas, because it goes boom and it's really hot. The second reaction is not balanced as it is. We need to balance this equation. So I'll change to a green num letter, so we, or green pin, so we can write. And again, we've already talked about this. I would challenge you to pause right now and try to balance the equation yourself before you go on and watch me, all right? So calcium and calcium are balanced so far. I have two chlorines on the left, 
but I have three chlorines way over here on the right. The first time chlorine will be equal to each other is going to be at six. So two times three gives me six, and three times two gives me six. So now the chlorines are balanced, but this three messed up something else. Now we need to go back and fix calcium. So I need to put a three in front of the calcium, but that messes up the carbonates, or does it? Now I have three carbonates, and look at that. Carbonate was inside parentheses with a three. Iron has a little two next to it, and there's a two down there in front of iron chloride. So again, the ratio of this is, it takes three calcium chloride moles to react with one mole of iron three carbonate. Then when those things react together, oh, and by the way, uh, don't cross check me on this. This reaction actually wouldn't take place because iron carbonate is not aqueous. It's gonna be that this is a problem, but just a bounce equation is not a big deal. So three, one, three, two. That would then be a balanced chemical equation, all right? So three of these and one of those come together. All the pieces get scrambled and mixed up and then they get spit back out as calcium carbonate and iron three chloride in the solution. Let's look at this last one one more time. Aluminum bromide reacts with chlorine gas. Remember there were seven diatomic molecules. Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine all exist in nature as a diatomic molecule. They have a little two. So Al and Al are good, but Cl, Brs, there's all these threes and twos. Do you see there's three Brs here, but two over there? So we need to put a three there and a two there. That gives me six BRs to go with six BRs, but it also gave me two aluminums, so I need to make two aluminums. Oh, look at that. That gives me six chlorines, which means I need six chlorines. So the ratio of these is two aluminum bromides, reacts with three chlorines. They mix up, kind of scramble around, and they spit back out aluminum chloride and bromine as an element. This would be a single replacement reaction. This is a synthesis reaction. This is a double replacement reaction if it were to actually happen, but that's not a big deal. So again, as we look at these, what we're looking at is the mole to mole ratio. So if I just asked you, if I went into the lab, and we're going to use this last one, and I have available to me, let's say, an unlimited supply of chlorine gas, like in one of those metal tanks, like old people use for oxygen gas, we have one of those of chlorine gas. Unlimited supply of chlorine, right? It's never going to run out. But I only have six moles. Actually, I'm going to write that in a different place. But if I have six moles of aluminum bromide, how many moles of bromine element can I get when I do this reaction? Well, this is never going to run out. We have this forever, right? It's like we're in the bread factory with bread. We would keep making sandwiches forever, never, never. But in this case, I have six moles of aluminum bromide and an unlimited supply of this. How many moles of bromine gas can we make? Well, the balanced equation is the ratio. If I had two moles, I would be able to make three of this. Going back up to water, if I had two moles of hydrogen, I could make two moles of water. But if I only had one mole of oxygen, I could, only make, I could still make two moles. It's a one to two ratio. This is a two to three ratio. Two aluminum bromides will make three bromines. So if I start with six, how many of these can I make? This is where we get back into our dimensional analysis idea again. So I'm going to do this as a dimensional analysis problem, and we're going to stop here for today. And then you're going to get to get some practice on an assignment on Moodle. Six moles of aluminum bromide. For every two moles of aluminum bromide that I begin with, oh, that's a three. That's this number. That's how many moles I'm starting with. I can make three moles of bromine as an element. So the ratio is two to three, and now I just do math. The moles of aluminum bromide are gonna cancel. I take six divided by, or sorry, six times three divided by two, and hopefully you've realized the answer will be nine moles of Br2. The mole to mole ratio is the important part here. You've got to be able to look at a balanced chemical equation and understand if I'm starting with some number of moles of this, how many moles of the other things will I need if it's a reactant, or will I make if it's a product? The mole to mole ratio tells you how much you're going to be using in terms of moles. All right, on Moodle, there's an assignment called uh, simple stoichiometry, which are problems just about this. 
Every single problem gives you moles of something and you have to solve for moles of something else. There is no other conversions yet. When I get back next week, not next week, like Thursday or Friday, we'll talk a little bit more about how this is going to work out and how you're going to be using grams to moles and moles to grams to keep doing more things with these reactions. This is one of the key aspects of chemistry. It's really, really super important. And so we're gonna spend a little bit of time on this, probably about three weeks on stoichiometry and the percent compositions and some other things that are gonna show up. Hope you had a good time. Hope you did well on the test. Enjoy learning about moles. I'm sorry this is a little bit longer of a video than I wanted it to be, but it's kind of important. You don't have to worry about that until Thursday. All right, work on that Moodle assignment, work on the worksheet that you have in class, and we will see you on Thursday.